Hello, welcome to the World Park Congress in Sydney, and I'm with a very distinguished guest here, Sylvia Rail. Hello, Sylvia. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Somewhere it's <good> morning. <laughs> exactly. So you were uh, you you were national or you are National Geographic's explorer uh, in residence. In residence, yes. Yep. Not in residence very often now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Time Magazine recognised you as Hero of the Planet, right. and you've got a nickname, Sturgeon, the Sturgeon General. Yeah, and her deepness. <laughs> And her deepness. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. What can I say? Exactly. So I, I was reading that you first uh, got involved with the oceans when you were a little girl. You were knocked over by a wave. Right. Could you describe that? Well, how, how that well, what sort of I happened? Found it frightening at first because I couldn't breathe. But once my toes touched the sand and I could stand up and breathe, I found it exhilarating. And my mother, mother of all mothers, might have just snatched me out of the ocean seeing that her daughter was, <laughs> went underwater and disappeared. <laughs> but when I came out, I had this big smile on my face and she let me go back in. And I've been going back in ever since. Amazing. So you hold some records as well, don't you, for the, some, of the, some of the biggest dives that have ever been done? Yeah, I've lady. never been looking for records, but so little has been done about the ocean that it's fairly easy to be the first to do this or the first to do that. And some of the things that I have done, I've lived underwater on 10 different occasions. You know, stay underwater in an underwater laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time I did it was in 1970 with uh, leading a team of women scientists and engineers. And, but you know, you're so, so limited using the compressed air methods or even mixed gas methods. The average depth of the ocean is two and a half miles. So I, I've actually developed and worked with developing technologies started three companies to do this, to gain access to the deep sea. Average depths, imagine, two and a half miles, four kilometers plus, wow. the maximum seven miles, 11 kilometers, and only three people in all of history have been to the deepest part, and I'm not yet one of them, I hope I am someday, <laughs> but the, the systems that I have used, a system called the gym, it's like an astronaut suit, except it's hard instead of soft to withstand the pressure. Went to 400 meters off the coast of Hawaii in 1979. So it's a solo dive down to the deep sea, but that also was what really got me going, inspired me to start ventures to build technologies. I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, but I work with engineers to develop the systems to make it possible for us to go either directly, a system called the Deep Rover, went to a thousand meters, and the company that I started that my daughter and son-in-law own and operate now called Deep Ocean Exploration and Research in California, Alameda, developing systems to not only go to a thousand meters with three people on board, but to go ultimately to full ocean depth. Wow. wow. Let's go. <laughs> and robots too. They've got a 6,000 500 meter system that with a cable back to the surface that could easily go out to where the Malaysian aircraft was lost in the mm -hmm. southern Indian Ocean. Not so much for scouting, but for recovery. You know, arms, cameras, sensors, what it takes to actually work underwater to as much as half the ocean's depth, a bit more, 6,500 meters. So the technology exists. This is not the only piece of equipment that can go that deep, but mm -hmm. it's one of the handful that exists. And what are we thinking? <laughs> Think of all the airplanes up in the sky. I mean, millions of people fly seven miles in the sky. And it's terrific transportation. We learn so much from going not just there, but off into space. But the ocean space is being neglected. Mm -hmm. We, we, enjoy the benefits of going up, and it's paying off handsomely. We're, we've neglected the ocean, and it's costing us dearly mm -hmm. right now. Our inability to find aircraft that <laughs> drop into the ocean. Why? It should be relatively simple. It's, you know, but we don't have the maps. We've only mapped the ocean seafloor, let alone the, the real ocean. That's the part from the bottom to the top, that's the ocean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the seafloor, a lot of people regard that as an appropriate destination, but it's, the ocean is the wet part. And 
we don't have good maps of what goes on in that in-between space. But even the seafloor, better maps of the moon, Mars, and Jupiter mm -hmm. than we have of our own planet. That's incredible. Could you give us a sense of what it's like to be that deep in the ocean? Huh. Well, <laughs> one thing that is so clear right away is that the ocean is not just rocks and water. The, the ocean is alive, and that hat is just wonderful, by the way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to look at you and say, this man is serious. <laughs> I know you are serious, I mean, seriously um, concerned about what's happening, mm -hmm. and, and thus your questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. So when, so when you're down there, you're, you're seeing a lot of the animals around you, and is that, was it very dark? diving into a starry night. When you get below a thousand feet, it's dark, except for bioluminescence. It's, it's a living system with more diversity, the greatest diversity of life on Earth mm -hmm. is ocean. And it's so simple when you think of it. Where is there life? Wherever there's water. No water, no life. Mm -hmm. And 97% of Earth's water is ocean. There would not be trees without water. They sink their roots into the ground and get groundwater, but where does that come from? Mostly the ocean. Mm -hmm. And no ocean, no life. I like to say no blue. No green. Mm -hmm. And you take a bucket full of ocean water from almost anywhere, you're sure to find broad diversity of life, unless it's really polluted water. And then you might get a, a large number of a few species of bacteria or something. But life is everywhere where there's water on this planet, even beneath the cracks in the rocks on the land, down in the earth where there's water, bacteria thrive. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have slow metabolism, but they're there. In the deep sea, it's not just the water column where you get essentially all of the major divisions of animal, plant, microbial life, whatever. But the history of life is there. You see it every time you dive. You see these gelatinous creatures pulse by, and you think, you know what? There go my ancient relatives. The DNA in that jellyfish is a whole lot like the DNA in me. Mm. It's true with all life. There's a common chemistry. But we're just beginning to appreciate that whatever we do to the chemistry of life on Earth, we're doing to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's in our best interest to hold the planet steady, to maintain the integrity of systems on the land and in the sea that make Earth a hospitable place in a universe of very unfriendly options. Mm -hmm. And that's what this conference in Sydney really is focused on. How do we protect nature mm -hmm. on the land and in the sea? Which means, in the end, how do we protect ourselves without knowing the consequences or the history of humankind we've taken from the natural systems to underpin our prosperity. You know, we cut the trees, build our houses, or burn the trees to put in agriculture or to <laughs> whatever it is, build, put our houses where the forests once were. In the ocean, starting seriously in the 20th century on a scale that is unprecedented, we're clear-cutting the oceans too. Hmm. of life. You know, there aren't trees out there in the ocean, although the photosynthesis, the heavy lifting of generating oxygen and taking up carbon is done by the tiny little photosynthetic organisms, microbial phytoplankton that takes up huge quantities of carbon dioxide, generates huge quantities of oxygen. More than half of the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from these rapidly turning over phytoplankton organisms that also capture the carbon and drive the great ocean food webs. Mm -hmm. So as trees capture carbon, and we understand that, we give carbon credits and our great <laughs> concern about climate change, but we've been a little slow to pick up on the reality that all the life in the sea, they're all carbon-based units too. So a big fish packs a lot of carbon. Mm -hmm. 
and when we take it out of the ocean, we essentially burn that carbon, release it to the atmosphere. Whether we use the fish for fertilizer, or for cow food, or for people food, or whatever, we, we, when we cut the food chains in the ocean, we put ourselves at risk with respect to the flow of carbon, the nutrient cycles. That when fish swim in the ocean they, and eat down long twisted food chains, they give nutrients back that power the phytoplankton. It's the big cycle that goes round and round. There is basically no waste in the ocean. Mm -hmm. We have a big problem with sewage disposal. Not a problem in the ocean with, with the natural systems. Little tiny crustaceans, they eat, they give nutrients back. The little fish, they eat, they give nutrients back. The big fish, they eat the little fish, give nutrients back. But it all stays under the lid of the ocean. And when wow. the fish ultimately expire, they sink to the bottom of the ocean, and that's where carbon storage and great sediments in the sea floor, that, that's where carbon is basically sequestered mm -hmm. for the long haul. Okay. So you refer to the ocean as the blue heart of Earth. Can you describe what that means? Well, when you think about what keeps us alive, what keeps us alive, you know, I think our heart is vital to our existence. The ocean is vital to the planet's existence as a living system. No ocean, no life. No ocean, no us. The ocean, in a way, is the planet's circulatory system, driving climate and weather, moving masses of water with heat and cold that drive, the, the, I mean, it's the thermal regulator of the planet, captures heat holds it cold and holds it, distributes these great thermal systems throughout the ocean, but also nutrients. So you can see where upwelling occurs, deep, nutrient-rich cold water from the depths emerges in places like off the coast of Peru. Mm -hmm. And you get great abundance of life, some of the great fisheries of the world. Uh, you should say the great abundant populations of fish. Fisheries is a human concept. You know, we want to take that life out of the sea. But it's abundance of life. And uh, around the world, there are places where upwelling of deep, cold water just stimulates this a certain productivity that is on an on exceptionally large scale. So, huh, what else? You know, generating oxygen, taking up carbon, just whole making home for most of life on Earth. That's where 97% of the biosphere is, the ocean. I mean, we think we're the boss of the world, and in a way, we are. Not so a million years ago, when our numbers were small, our technologies very primitive. Even 10,000 years ago, our numbers were in the millions, not in the billions. Go back to 1800, the first billion of us were generated by consuming the natural world. That's the source of our prosperity. For space, for food, for all the goods that we've used to develop our civilization. I mean, all creatures use their environment, whether it's birds building nests out of the materials that are there, or earthworms in the ground, they all modify and adapt the world to suit them. But nothing on a scale that humans have done over the last few thousand years, and especially over the last century. Mm -hmm. We're talking decades of unprecedented change. We've learned more owing to the technologies that we have and the history that, that precedes us. You know, every generation learns and conveys to the next. That's what, part of what makes us so extraordinary as human beings. We gather knowledge and then we tell our children children know more each time than those before them. At least you hope that's true. Mm -hmm. So that here we are in the 21st century with kids armed with the power of knowing things that the smartest people who ever lived in all preceding time hadn't yet figured out. But now <laughs> we don't have to design a cell phone. It's there for us to capitalize that asset 
so that we can access knowledge that has been accumulating and maybe just in time, that perspective that here we are in a universe where Earth is an exceptional place, but it's, it's vulnerable. Mm. We are changing the nature of nature through our actions. And we, we couldn't know that when I was a kid. But the kids of day get a jump start understanding that view of Earth from space, connecting the dots, the ability to measure polar ice and see how it's receding, the correlation with carbon dioxide that we've released over the ages, burning trees, burning coal, burning increasingly oil and gas to create a different world mm -hmm. than existed when I was a child or any child in all preceding time. <laughs> So I was going to ask you, uh, when you mentioned in your lecture last night that uh, you've seen a lot of changes since you, since you first went into the oceans, what, what have been the biggest changes that you've noticed? Well, I tell people sometimes that I come from a different planet. My friends say, oh, right, we knew that. <laughs> but the planet was really different. Less CO2 in the atmosphere by, you know, significant... Mm -hmm. More fish. <laughs> of course, there are now more of us. There are only two billion people on Earth when I arrived. Now, seven billion, and climbing toward maybe nine by the middle of this century, unless microbes take over and give us a hard time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's certainly a potential. We're already seeing the effects of of powerful diseases that are. Well, part of our, it's just part of the way the world functions. Mm -hmm. uh, we're set up for, for disaster in some ways because, what? anyway, that, that capacity to see the whole world is new. And since I arrived on the planet, no one had been to the moon. Mm -hmm. No one had been to the deepest ocean. There's so many new, under, uh, just explorations. No one had imagined that the continents actually pulled apart over time. Continental drift, the explanation for it, uh, really didn't come into focus until in the late 1970s. Well, there was one, at least one scientist, who could see how the great continents fit together like the pieces of a puzzle and and suggested that maybe over time continents were united and then moved apart. But when I was a kid, a young uh, aspiring oceanographer, we were told to, that that was a ridiculous concept because it did, how could that possibly be? <laughs> but now we know that it it's the reality. We have the evidence. So it's that, that we've learned more since I arrived on the planet, I think it's safe to say that during all preceding history about the nature of the world and about the big questions such as who we are and where we have come from mm -hmm. and maybe most importantly, where we're going or if we have a goal in mind, how are we going to get there? And I think the goal that many have in mind, myself included, is how do we look at this planet with now, informed eyes, see what we're doing, understand it's our life support system. How do we manage ourselves to keep the world intact, to keep it safe for the generations who are coming along, so that we don't burn through all the assets, you know, close the options, kill all the sharks. We've reduced the number by about 90%. We have the capacity to eat the last bluefin tuna if we choose to. Their numbers when I was a kid were here. We were so good at catching them and eating them, turning them into sushi and sashimi and whatever it is, however you like your tuna, tuna fish sandwiches. Mm -hmm. It isn't just bluefins, it's the whole wondrous family of high-speed fish that are top carnivores that are just hammered right now with technologies that didn't exist when I was a child. Mm -hmm. Their technologies developed for well, fighting, killing one another. Now we're using them to 
go out and find and capture and kill fish, these sonar techniques that are wonderful new ways to, to see with sound. Bats do it, dolphins do it, certain high-flying insects use a kind of sonar to, to find where they're going. And, and there's nothing wrong with sonar at all. We're mapping the ocean using sonar. It's how we deploy it and, and how we use the results. To be able to find every last fish, zoom it, zero in on them and capture them using these advanced new technologies, high-speed boats, canal can access anywhere on the planet, almost, uh, technologies that can access the deep sea that heretofore has been inaccessible, uh -huh. protected by inaccessibility, but no longer. Now fish that appear in markets all over the world were taken from thousands of feet beneath the surface of the ocean. Uh, innocent creatures that <laughs> never knew humans as a predator in all of their history, and now we presume that we can just take without consequences. Imagine going to Antarctica, where you know, exploration of the Antarctic continent, as well as the waters around Antarctica, all basically global commons. The waters around Antarctica are part of the high seas, global commons, not owned by any one nation, owned, if it, by any, by all. Mm -hmm. And yet, a handful of nations send fleets from thousands of miles away to Antarctic waters to capture krill, these little shrimp-like creatures, crustaceans, that are so important in Antarctic food webs, in the Antarctic carbon cycle, the oxygen cycle, the chemistry of the ocean. And we just treat them as goods, as commodities to take out of the ocean millions of tons and over the last few decades not only extracted them but also squid and and various kinds of long-lived deep dwelling slow to reproduce fish they're abundant because they represent the distillation of all preceding history but when you take them you leave a hole that isn't quickly replenished uh, you cut the lawn in your yard, and the grass grows back. The root systems stay intact, and they're fast growing. These fish, Chilean sea bass, may take 25 years just to mature before they can start to reproduce. Orange roughy, it's more like 30 years, and they may live to be more than a century old. So we wow. casually eat fish that are older than our great grandparents <laughs> and we think it's okay they'll grow back <laughs> well maybe not mm -hmm. what's your biggest recommendation to government leaders in the protection of oceans what's what's the thing that you would call for them to do we must protect the ocean as if our lives depend on it because they do I mean that's the short answer mm -hmm. right now the policies that we apply to ocean ecosystems are largely focused on ex exploitation. Look at the Arctic. How can we extract the oil and the gas that's under the ice where no human in all of our history has ever been able to gain access before? But now with our technologies and with the melting of polar ice, suddenly there it is. We can get to it. So everybody's out to grab what's there, minerals. Deep sea mining is another mm -hmm. example that in the late 70s and on through the 80s, there was a lot of interest in mining manganese nodules, these formations in the deep sea floor that apparently are part of a biological process, the microbes that, that, that take these special minerals, whether it's gold or silver or copper or chromium or nickel, magnesium, is a, a manganese, <laughs> all the, the whole you know, spectrum of minerals, there are some microbes that have the capacity to extract the minute amounts that are in seawater 
and deposit them as crusts, or not just from the seawater, but sometimes from the depths of the earth itself, where hot water comes gushing out from deep within the earth, where there's certain bacteria that can, I mean, it's not just that they can withstand high temperature, that's their home. They can't withstand cool temperature. They're, they're thermophiles. They like hot water. <laughs> I mean, hotter than we could, than, than most forms of life could, could imagine being able to, to sustain an existence. But they take the minerals that are dissolved from deep within the earth, and they thrive on it, and they deposit these crusts, something that, images that didn't exist again when I was a child, starting in the late 1970s and moving on up to the present time. We now know about hydrothermal vents in the deep sea mm -hmm. that are rich in certain valuable, well, minerals that are valuable in the current economy. And manganese nodules, these lumps, size of potatoes, or sometimes <laughs> beans, or sometimes big rocks that are larger than potatoes. But carpeting the sea floor, but it's a distillation of many thousands of years of actions by these microbes to create these formations that in a short period of time, using, again, heavy-handed technologies to scrape the ocean floor, to gather them up and crush them to extract whatever minerals we're looking for, including some that are now considered valuable in our, in our communications technologies. And, I don't know, it's, it's a concern because we don't know the cost of what we're, what we're losing in the process of taking these minerals. Mm -hmm. it, it really is mining because they're not going to come back anytime soon, if ever, mm -hmm. once you've extracted them. But the ocean is alive. What other values are inherent in the deep sea systems that all we can see is the value of the minerals. What about all the rest? I mean, I think about aliens looking at London or Washington or, or San Francisco or any of, the, of our great cities. And all they want is the cement. Mm -hmm. And they don't know anything about our art, or our music, or our sense of humor or our libraries, or things that we think of as special for us, for humankind. In the deep sea, there are communities of life that have been developing over hundreds of millions wow. of years, and we <coughs> are just beginning to access them. And like the aliens flying over New York City, oh, look at all that cement, let's go get it. <laughs> Grab up the the buildings and chop them up into little pieces and distill out the cement and everything that you think of is important about our civilization is just dust. Wow. And that's how we are looking now at the ocean as, ooh, I, we can make money right now, short-term interest, not even knowing enough to be able to calculate the real cost. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying we sh shouldn't explore possibility of mining the deep sea, but to do it blindly without at least exploring and evaluating the reality of what's there and be conscious of what might be the cost. And the precautionary principle would suggest, okay, if we do it on a sampling basis, let's take this huge area that we will protect proactively agree. We're not going to touch these manganese nodules. That's our, that's our safety blanket. That's our insurance policy. We might mine in this area, but let's agree not to mine in that huge area because we don't know what's there. And, and it's a hedge against the unknown. But what we do know is once you've destroyed it, you're not going to ever know what the benefits might have been. Like rainforests. Mm -hmm. You know that the earth under rainforest can be used to grow cows. It can be used in the short term to grow soy or corn. But what are you losing when you trade off the distillation, again, of millions of years of diversity of life with all the 
many answers to questions that we, we, we yearn for. It isn't just new medicines, but a new insight into, look at a dragon, dragonfly, um, how they twist their wings. Uh, aeronautic engineers are now learning for creatures like dragonflies. Suppose we lost all dragonflies. Mm -hmm. These are ancient creatures that have certain needs. And not all dragonflies are alike either. I mean, you've got many species, but just having one species as your aeronautical example is probably not so smart. It's mm -hmm. like tuna, too. Uh, engineers at MIT sigh with envy when they see a bluefin tuna powering its way through the ocean. How do they do that <laughs> with just a modest little flip of their tail? And by studying tuna, engineers have discovered that that tuna and now other fish, it appears as well, capture. But first they generate these little whirlpools, vortices, that are captured and, and propel the fish at high speed through the ocean. Wow. And can we capitalize on that? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Streamlining is another thing. Uh, some of these high speed fish like tunas and swordfish and others in this great family of high speed ocean creatures actually bring their dorsal fin into a slot so that they become totally smooth and their pectoral fins get put into the little pockets, it's not, not deep, like depressions on the side, so that they are so streamlined, they become like bullets when they go through the ocean. <laughs> so any, they reduce drag, uh -huh. while at the same time, they have this very efficient way of capturing the little whirlpools of energy created when they <laughs> do this with their tail. I mean, <laughs> there's so much to learn from the natural systems, the creatures who are there, that we can eat the tuna, we can destroy the forests that hold answers that can keep us prosperous on into the future in a much more efficient way than simply burning through the assets without understanding the real value of what's there. Mm -hmm. What's your biggest recommendation to the general public? Use your brain. Oh, gosh. <laughs> realize, realize that you have power of knowing that as never before, we are empowered with a perspective that should see us through this tight spot that we're currently advancing toward. You know, with excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, no generation before this time could know what we now know, know the risks involved with burning fossil fuels. Knowing that means hey, we've got a problem. Let's get about solving that problem. Instead of just saying, oh, we've got a problem. Very interesting. And then you go over the cliff. <laughs> we have the power of acting on what we know. And that's cause for hope. Mm -hmm. Understanding the value of nature. The IUCN World Parks Congress that happens every 10 years here in Sydney. That we're part of the action here to value nature, to see it not just for its beauty, although that's true, not just for recreation, although that's true, not just because it's a nice thing to do, even because it's the ethically smart thing to do, but because our lives depend on the natural systems that give us life. Mm -hmm. If you like to breathe, you'll listen up. Now we know where air, where oxygen in air comes from. And we can see it, we can measure it, we can see it being generated on the land. We can see it being generated in the ocean. We can witness the carbon cycle and we can witness the degradation of our life support system. So there are dead zones that have been generated in the ocean through what we've put into it and also what we've taken out. Mm -hmm. When you remove fish and lobsters and clams and oysters and other wildlife from the sea, you're extracting elements from our life support system. Chesapeake Bay in North America, the oysters that once were part of the, the filtration system 
of that great body of water, turning over the water, you know, taking in the, the water and the plankton and, and all whatever that was there, the silt, they sifted out and expelled clean water. Well, from the time when my father arrived on the planet in 1900 to a century later, the numbers of oysters had been so successfully extracted that only on the order of 2% remain. Wow. And you'd say, that's horrible. But the good news is we still have a few oysters in Chesapeake <laughs> Bay. Stop killing them. That's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can start by planting trees, and people are now planting oysters, native oysters, that once made Chesapeake Bay, along with their fellow builders, the clams, the blue crabs, the menhaden, the little fish that is being extracted primarily because of the oil and because the, the, the meat, the fish itself, can be ground up and used for chicken food or pig food. or the People don't eat menhaden, and they shouldn't eat menhaden. They shouldn't kill menhaden because they're part of this amazing natural filtration system. Mm -hmm. And they also power the food webs that make it possible for there to be striped bass and tuna and swordfish and bluefish and dolphins and this whole spectrum of life. They are to the east coast of North America as krill are to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. They're the middleman between sunlight and the microorganisms, the plants that generate food. Big fish can't get to these tiny little plants, but they can eat the fish that eat the plants, or the krill that eat the plants. And these are things that I didn't know. In fact, I could not know that when I was a child mm -hmm. in that other planet that I arrived on. But the kids of today can look at their cell phone, open a book, look at Google, what is a menhaden? What's its role in the ocean? Why should we protect menhaden? Uh, what's happened to the Chesapeake Bay? What's happened to the Great Barrier Reef mm -hmm. since the 1950s? Or more importantly, since protection began in the 1970s? The effort was made to protect the Great Barrier Reef with measures that, that tried to regulate fishing and established some areas that were fully protected, where even the lobsters and the oysters and the clams and the fish had safe havens, but it was a small part of the reef. And over the years, degradation was clearly happening. And so they protected a bit more. And in recent years, as much as a third of the Great Barrier Reef Park mm -hmm. really is fully protected. And it does make a difference, but the reef is still inexorably declining, partly because so much has been removed partly because of the warming trend, the global mm. effect, and now acidification of the ocean, changing ocean chemistry, plus what is flowing in from the land, the agricultural effluents, the excess fertilizers, it's too valuable to throw into the ocean, and it's harmful when these fertilizers get into the ocean. But we haven't calculated the real cost or the real risk to us. Mm -hmm. We are now able to look at the whole picture, that it's not just sadness over the loss of the Barrier Reef or how we need to more effectively embrace these natural systems so that they can recover their health for their sake, but also back to us for our sake. Mm -hmm. We need the benefits that nature delivers for us to survive as well. Sure. Okay. So for the next generation of scientists and, and researchers, what is your biggest recommendation to them? Well, back to protect the natural systems, as if your life depends on it. <laughs> Do what you can, whoever you are. I mean, scientists, of course, to learn what you can so that we can be smarter mm -hmm. and more efficient and more effective about using the natural world to propel our way forward, uh, or to think about coming to grips with the limits of 
of our home planet. And we, we're pushing the envelope with what we're putting into the atmosphere. We're pushing the envelope with our consumption of the natural systems. We're, we're seeing the consequences in terms of poverty, in terms of, of starvation. But when you use the natural world with an eye toward long-term sustainability, there's a chance that we can maybe maintain a planet that works in our favor with as many as nine billion people. More effective, efficient use of the food we've already got. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, looking to the sea for more food is an illusion. Uh, there just isn't enough. Well, here's where the fish were, here's where they are, and whether it's fish or shrimp, or even the little copepods that help power the system, we have already altered that great part of the planet that keeps us alive. Our highest priority has to be, has to be, to restore it to a better place and to get smarter about what we eat. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. we, we need to more efficiently uh, capture the sunlight energy through plants and focus on the plants. That's where the most efficient way to feed ourselves is. And the animals that we might choose to eat, we should grow them, whether they're fish or, or some of the animals we now grow, but get smarter about how we do it. So whether you're an aspiring scientist or an aspiring musician or an aspiring lawyer or, or, or whatever it is, just being a mom and dad, being a human being. Mm -hmm. You have the capacity to use the power of knowing to good advantage and to find a place for yourself within human society that can make a difference and, and not be overwhelmed by the naysayers who say, it's over, we might as well give up, have a good time because Earth is in a <laughs> destiny toward a disaster no matter what we do. Mm -hmm. It does matter what we do. Of course. Yep. Just one last question, if I may. In the years that you've been working in and around the ocean, what's your, been your fondest memory? Oh, it's coming. Really? Out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you should always think about what's the next thing around mm -hmm. the corner while you savor wonderful experiences of the past. And, uh, Has there ever been that moment where you've just gone, wow, you've just seen... So many moments. Oh, <laughs> but one that really sticks out. Maybe when I first opened my eyes, is a you know, oh, what is this being alive business? <laughs> wow. <laughs> we should all treasure the very fact that we're alive and don't waste a moment. Sylvia, this has been a fantastic interview. Thank you very much. Thank you. For your time. Cheers.